Hello, and welcome to Within Your Reach. I'm your host, Christine McShane, and over the next hour, I'm gonna be taking you to some of the most interesting places in the North State. Places you may have heard about, but have never actually been. Some have made it into the history books, others were designed specifically with families in mind. And at the end of the show, I'll show you how to create the perfect memento from your trip, made with things you probably already have around your home. Our journey begins at California's second largest reservoir, Lake Oroville. It's located on the Feather River about 75 miles north of Sacramento and is formed by the nation's tallest earthen dam, which was once called the ninth wonder of the world. There are close to 170 miles of forested shoreline, a true fisherman's delight. You'll find spotted bass, Chinook salmon, rainbow trout and catfish beneath these waters. And if fishing isn't your thing, no worries. How about hanging out on a houseboat? It's one of the area's biggest draws and a place you'll find most Chico State students when they're not on campus. Well, we're gonna take a little trip out on a houseboat today. I'm joined here today by John, the general manager here at Lake Oroville Marina. Thank you for joining us here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Oh, it's gonna be fun. You're, he's actually gonna be our captain today. But John, it was really hard to pick just one thing to do because you've got so much to offer here. Can you tell us a few things that you have? Um, well, the, the possibilities are endless for recreating on Lake Oroville. We've got about 167 miles of shoreline, great fishing, great water skiing, great wakeboarding, and just plain recreating and relaxing with family and friends. Uh, we offer an array of ski boats, deck cruisers, uh, PWCs, and of course our houseboat fleet that Forever Resorts is famous for. Um, today we're going to be taking a 59 Deluxe out. We're going to be seeing some of the area, uh, starting with the West Branch here, and we're going to move into the North Fork. And uh, obviously uh, uh, generating electricity was one of the big reasons of this dam uh, being placed here in Orville. And uh, we'll tour by the old powerhouse, the area that used to be in the North Fork, and uh, see some of the sites around. Well, I'm excited to get started, so let's hop to it. Thank Sounds you. Sounds great. John, we've come out a fair way onto the lake and there's so much beauty, but there's also a lot of history here. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are right now? Well, right now we're starting to head up the North Fork of the Feather River and uh, across from us was the Big Bend powerhouse of yesteryear. It was built in about 1908 and it was the largest powerhouse uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, until 1967 it was operating when they filled Orville here. Um, and then, of course, the Orville Dam was the largest earthen-filled dam in the world at that time. And then there's lots of little coves and things I'm seeing. Now, do you send the houseboats out? Because this houseboat's beautiful and you can spend the night on it too. Do you give people directions to where they can go to when they come out? Absolutely. Um, we have a map of the lake and uh, we give them an orientation and explain how to stake off the houseboat and give them ideas of, of where they might see what they're looking for. Obviously, uh, with no homes around the area, there's uh, no light saturation from uh, you know, the city and so people are looking for the, towards the celestial skies for uh, meteor showers and uh, possibly even a full moon. Lovely. Sounds like a nice way to get away for the weekend. And so we're just going to head on up to the North Fork. Uh, we're going to cruise up into the North Fork. Uh, it's heavily forested and uh, it's, uh, it has never been burnt by fire. Mm. Obviously in California, you know, fires have played a large part of the history here. Uh, but uh, we have some of the largest of the uh, Manzanita family, the Madrones. Oh. And so we'll get into some hundred footers. Uh, a really, really beautiful area. One of my favorite on the lake. And, uh, and as you know, this is uh, California's drinking water and uh, so uh, well, let's head on up. Well, actually, yeah, we should head up. But I would ask to ask you about that with the drinking water. So do you have any precautions that you take? You were saying it's fairly green a marina. Uh, we're a certified green marina and uh, uh, also a clean marina. 
Mm -hmm. um, we try to do everything on an environmentally friendly basis and green products and, uh, and uh, right from the building of our houseboats uh, all the way through uh, to how we uh, clean them and maintain them. Um, we encourage everybody to uh, take pride. Uh, it's really important that the water for the state of California starts out as pure as possible. And this is all coming from uh, rainfall and snowpack. So uh, uh, it, it's essential that as uh, uh, California's large demand for water, obviously uh, this is one of the, the, this is the state's largest reservoir with uh, Lake Shasta being a federal reservoir, but this is the largest of the state reservoirs. Well, it's time to head back to shore and check out some of the other main attractions here in Oroville. But before we go, John, I have to say this has been the most spectacular day here on the lake, thanks to you and your absolutely wonderful houseboat. Well, I got to thank you, Christine, for uh, giving us a wonderful opportunity to show you what Lake Oroville has to offer. And you had a wonderful crew you brought with you today. And um, it was absolutely spectacular. It was. And so if you would like to experience a day like this, just check out their website for hours and rentals. Thank you, you can find us at lakeorvillemarina.com. Well, we've talked a lot about fishing, one of man's favorite pastimes. Well, here comes another one, but this one I'm actually quite partial to myself. We're at the Bolts Antique Tool Museum here in Oroville. Who better to show us around than the man himself, Mr. Bud Bolt. Thank you very much for having us here today. Well, thank you for coming and especially calling me Mr. because that don't happen very often. Well, my know. pleasure. <laughs> well, no, it's great to have you. Yeah. And, and you're that beautiful lady they said they were sending down. Is that That's right. Okay. Yeah, and here I am. <laughs> so. Well, I can see this is quite a passion for you with all the collection of tools. How did you actually get started with this? Well, let's uh, show you how we got started, shall we? Back in the 50s, I was branch manager for Snap-on Tools. And when that hit the publicity in Salt Lake City, the schools started immediately inviting us out to speak on the primarily the merits of the famous detachable socket. I was young and experienced. I had 15, 16 year old students in front of me, difficult to get and hold their attention. So in Pocatello, Idaho in 1957, I gathered up those six tools tied them on that panel board, carried them into that shop class, and explained to these students that now that's what grandpa and dad had to work with, this is what you get to work with. Tools are the most important man-made product on the planet. And I uh, found that exciting 50 some years ago and it's just as exciting today. With tools, the human being can do anything, and without tools, we're just another animal. So that's what got me hooked, and I'm still hooked. <laughs> I can see that. That was quite profound, actually. Yeah. But you've actually put up some beautiful displays of the history of tools, too. Can we take a look at your blacksmith ones? Sure we can. Mm -hmm. You bet. Now, the reason we start and honor the blacksmith with the first display is because the blacksmith was a world tool maker for 2,200 years. Wow. When steel was first discovered in the Middle Ages, it was used only for weapons of war. There wasn't anything mechanical to use it on. And he was the most important man in the community because it took him to keep things working. So now I heard you have a display of women's tools, which of course I would like to see, so. Well, I tell you what, let's just take a look at these panels right here because these are household and primarily ladies' tools. Well, see, these aren't the kind I use. They're not the kind no, you use? No, I'm well, using skill saws and things, but this, this is all right. It sounds yeah. like maybe you're old-fashioned. Now, this you probably could still use if you had it. That's a, a rug beater called a whisk to hang your rug on the 
clothesline or an over a fence and beat the dirt out of it. So that's kind of a fascinating tool. Now, this is one when you was stoking your your wood your stove. Fire, yeah. That's what you went in and moved your coal. So they were into uh, you know recycling back then too with the soap saver. Well, no, that soap saver was on our farm. Uh, I was the youngest of eight children. So mom and dad and eight kids and being the youngest, I got my bath last. Uh. And you could walk on the water by then. But uh, <laughs> the fact is, nothing was ever thrown away. Right. Every scrap of soap was put in here and then you swish that through your water and that's where you got your soap for oh. your, for your oh. once a month bath if you're lucky enough to get it. I'm curious about this piece over here. Okay, that's a, that's a clothes hanger. That adjust it and come out under my shirt, and then you just hung it up. And oh, I see. You had, your, like you had your kind of stretched out a little right. bit and kept its shape a little better. Wow. Yeah. And then the bar tool, huh? yeah. what is this for? Oh, I see. It's a, yeah, um, yeah, it's a little shot glass. A little shot glass is what mm -hmm. we call it. Okay. Well, here's a nice saver. This is a real unique one that you needed. It was a, was a coal hammer to uh, break your lumps of coal up for your, either primarily your kitchen stove. So well, knife sharpeners, nutcrackers. Yeah. Yeah, everybody needs a raisin grinder. A so, raisin grinder? Yeah. Yes, I was missing mine. Well, there you, it is. If I'm missing mine when you leave, you're gonna be in trouble. All right. <laughs> okay, so. Well, and, and now I see that there's lots of different size tools too. I heard that you actually have a really large wrench. Well, let's see. Let's go back here. Come on, guys. I'll take you back here first. And then I'll show you the... Uh, we got a lot of large wrenches, but we got a big dude back here. At least a cutout of it. This is the wrench standing beside the man. It was six feet long. Weighed 160 some pounds. And that was a monster primarily used for bridge construction around 1903. It took machines to build industry, and it took tools to build machines. If we didn't have tools, we would never have any machines, we wouldn't have any industry, we'd still be lugging the stone around living in a cave. So this monkey wrench is the most important man-made product ever made, because when it come on the scene in 1835, it made it possible for, for people to start mass producing machines. Oh, I see. Up until then, everything was handmade and mass production was out of the question. At the peak of production, there was 400 companies making monkey wrenches. They were making 1,100 type styles and sizes. We can only find the production figures on seven companies, and those seven were making over 4 million monkey wrenches a year. Everything in this time frame was square nuts. Now the main problem with this was these were rarely ever square because they were all handmade. Oh yeah. So if you had a fixed wrench, it probably wouldn't have fit anyway. It had to have something adjustable. Uh -huh. So the most important man-made product ever made was the monkey wrench. Oh, that, okay. that moved us into the Industrial Revolution and got us to where we're at. So are all the pieces here um, things that you have found or have they been donated or is it a kind of a combination? When we donated our original collection to the city of Orville and to the public, right. we had about 5,000 tools wow. and now we're at 10,807. You guys and your whole crew look like you're in good health, but if you get in trouble in here, need an amputation, we can handle it right here on the spot. Well, you know what? That is something. I've done two amputations in my time. Have you? Yes. Well, no, I, hope, you're, I hope your success rate's as good as ours, because ours is up to almost 50%. Well, I never did so. check on that, so I'm fine. I just, like, I just tell the first part. <laughs> anyway. Well, tools have come a long way, because now we're, they're integrated in our life to make our lives so much easier. You've got leaf blowers and you've got hair dryers and all kinds of things that we use all the time without even thinking of them as tools. Sure. So how do you, what do you think about that in terms of how they re, kind of relate to 
the tools that we're talking about here today. Well, of course, it's been fantastic. The modern tool that you'd buy today off of a reputable tool company is way better than anything was built here. So over these years, as the need developed, the tool companies have done a fabulous job of producing the product to service today's, right. whether it's aircraft, whether it's motorcycles, cars, boats, whatever. Well, if you enjoyed Bud's stories as much as I have, but you'd like to hear more, try his Bud Bolts Stories book. You can buy that here. Now, can you buy this online as well, or is it just here no, at the store? Well, you can get it online, but it'd be better to come in. You know, it would be better to come in, because yes. then you'll know which of these stories you haven't heard. If they really want to get the story, right. they really need one of these DVDs for a $10 bill. This covers two and a half hours of uh, presentation, historical presentation, evolution of tools, tour of the museum, interview, and then my uh, presentation on the Dust Bowl. The museum is located at 1650 Broderick Street in Oroville and is open from 10 a.m. to 345 Monday through Saturday. 345? Why 45? Well, that's because of the city used to open and close. And they had three museums to close at four o'clock and somehow those people couldn't move fast enough to be in three places at one time. Well, how about so that? So they closed us at 345. Ah, and 10 o'clock on Saturday? Well, we open at 10 o'clock for the convenience of the visitor. Mm -hmm. um, people love it because they want to come into town and maybe see three museums today. Well, if they're not open till noon, that's pretty hard to crowd them in. So by us opening at 10, they can come in, work our museum in the morning, have a nice lunch, maybe see a couple more. And if they're from Sacramento, maybe still get home ahead of the traffic. Wonderful. Well, so there you have it. Do check their website for hours. And if you would like to book a tour, uh, the information is there on their website. Well, we've made our way to Butte County's largest small city, Chico, a city of close to 90,000 people and rich in history. And you know, most of that history started right here on this plot of land. Well, I'm standing in front of the Bidwell Mansion, the big pink Victorian house on the Esplanade. It used to be the home of General John Bidwell and his wife, Annie. Bidwell was part of the first organized overland expedition of American settlers to California. Years later, he struck gold on the Feather River and bought the 26,000 acres along Chico Creek. In 1860, he founded the town of Chico. Bidwell served two years as a Washington congressman and in 1868 married Annie Kennedy. Believe it or not, General W.T. Sherman, General U.S. Grant, and President Johnson all attended their wedding. It cost $60,000 to build this three-story, 26-room mansion back in the day. It was quite a place to be seen. The pair hosted social and political events, but there was no smoking, drinking, gambling, or dancing ever allowed. The Bidwell spent time with many people, often mentioned throughout history. People like John Muir, who came to Chico on camping expeditions. It was Muir who actually brought Sir Joseph Hooker to Chico, and we all know him as the British botanist who named the Hooker Oak. Five years after John's death, Susan B. Anthony visited with Annie the day she deeded the land to Chico for Bidwell Park. Well, I have had a wonderful visit here at the Bidwell Mansion, and I've learned so much about the Bidwells, but even more about life in California in the late 1800s. Today, you can take tours of the mansion on Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays. Now, more than half of the tour is on the first floor, but for those of you who can't get up the stairs, you don't have to miss out on a thing. You can watch a video on the second and third floors. You can also take a little piece of the Bidwell Mansion home with you by buying something in the recently remodeled general store located in the visitor center. Our next stop in Chico is the Gateway Science Museum, right next to the Bidwell Mansion. It's a 9,700 square foot facility on the Chico State campus, showcasing everything from bugs to bears. How about we take a look inside? Now, right away, you'll notice the unique architecture of the building. That's actually an exhibit itself. 
we're in the Valley Gallery, and it runs from north to south with a concrete representation of the Sacramento River running right through it. And outside, you'll find landscapes that are modeled after the ecoregions of Northern California. And this amazing skylight is modeled after Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen, the North State's famous volcanoes. The concept for this museum was brought about in 1996. It wasn't until 14 years later the museum opened its doors. However, the educational program for the museum actually started in 2003, well before construction. And speaking of education, let's take a quick look at an interactive exhibit that lets you be the star. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it happens anyway, doesn't it? No, okay. <laughs> Why does it work? There are several galleries here, the Valley Gallery, the North Gallery and the Newberry Family Gallery. They all host travelling exhibits related to the science and natural history found throughout California. Bear in mind, of course, that history includes these big guys, bears, and we're going to learn a lot more about them today. A pedicure on this guy, well that would take a bit of doing, wouldn't it? That's really great. And these are the claws, wow. Mm -mm -mm. Quite a nail. Wow, you're not from around here, are you? Oh, don't worry, neither am I. Here's what a bear would eat. Fruits, nuts, bugs, and fish. This is going in, and this is what it looks like coming out. Hey! Come <laughs> back. Just want to play. Well, if that exhibit was too much to bear, you can mosey right on here to the discovery room. The kids are going to love this one because behind those windows are tarantulas and some of their friends. Now, outside the rooms and galleries are several other unique exhibits. And this one is about the world's pollinators, you know, butterflies and bees and such. And it has nine distinct sections. And this is the newest permanent exhibit here at the Gateway Science Museum. Yes, it's the Hooker Oak Legacy. And you can pop your donation right here in this box where the stand is made from the Hooker Oak tree itself. I wonder how many of you remember the hooker oak tree and the history behind it. At one time, Chico's hooker oak tree was considered to be the largest valley oak in the world, standing more than 100 feet tall. The circumference of the outside branches was nearly 500 feet, producing summer shade of close to 18,000 square feet. Due to its immense size, the tree was an important landmark and became recognized as a symbol of the city of Chico. The majesty of Hooker Oak was immortalized on screen in 1938 when The Adventures of Robin Hood, starring Errol Flynn, was filmed in Chico. Hooker Oak fell during a windstorm May 1, 1977. Once the tree fell, it was determined that Hooker Oak was actually two trees that had grown together, forming the appearance of a single tree. Now, you'll have to check their website for the current exhibits and ours because they change with the seasons. They actually have several traveling exhibits every year that are great for both adults and children. Now, we've had a great time here at the Gateway Science Museum, but it's time to head on over to Bidwell Park and explore the hundreds of acres of land that so many enjoy every day. Well, we have arrived at Bidwell Park. It's more than 3,600 acres of natural beauty and by far the greatest contribution Annie Bidwell made to this community. She deeded the original property of about 2,200 acres to the city in 1905, along with Children's Park downtown. An additional 1,300 acres were added with a purchase approved by the city in 1995. The park is divided into two distinct sections, Upper Park and Lower Park. 
and on any given day you can find people picnicking, walking, jogging or as in this case biking along the shady trails here in Lower Park. Or taking the plunge into One Mile Sycamore Pool, a man-made concrete reservoir with Big Chico Crete actually flowing right through it. The pool was constructed in 1920. A dam and a fish ladder control the creek's flow. The dam is raised and lifeguards are present from Memorial Day to Labor Day every year. If you've got your hiking shoes on, you can get yourself one heck of a workout heading up to Upper Park. Most start out at Horseshoe Lake. Upper Park is a steep canyon comprised of mostly underdeveloped land and volcanic rock. You'll find amazing swimming holes like Bear Hole and Salmon Hole, popular spots for the college kids who like to plunge into the creek below. One of the park's biggest claims to fame is the filming of the original adventures of Robin Hood. Yes, the dashing Errol Flynn ran right through the majestic oaks and sycamores in 1938. You'll find all the children running around in an amazing fairy tale land in Lower Park called Caper Acres. I'm betting most every kid who grew up here has a picture of Mr. Humpty Dumpty here. Say cheese! There's also the Crooked House and the Wooden Castle. Caper Acres is open every day except Monday. Well, there is no doubt about it, but this park is a main attraction here in Chico and one that shouldn't be missed. It's open from dawn until dusk, so come on down and enjoy it. Now, if you've worked up an appetite after biking through Bidwell, and that is easy to do, why not stop here and fuel up on something healthy? Or not, but that's what I'm gonna do. This is the Chico Certified Farmer's Market where you'll find plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, many of them are organic, from the local Chico farmers. Now this particular farmer's market has been around since 1980, but it's the only local market that's open all year long. Would you like to try one? Yes, love to, thank you. I'm getting some peaches, this is great. Oh, oh, um. Mm. Really good. And if you're in a spot with your spouse, why not fix the problem with these beautiful flowers? Just look at these beauties. We actually heard a lot of brides will wait until the morning of their wedding to buy their flowers in Chico, just so they can get these lovely arrangements at a great price. Now, if you'd like to try your hand at gardening, there's always the do-it-yourself booth, and you'll always find a variety of flowers. Well, of course, it wouldn't be a Chico market without bags of these little guys. Almonds. No, no, wait, hang on a minute. Why do they say almonds up here instead of almonds? Because we knocked the L out of them to get them off the tree. Oh, that is terrible. $15, thank you. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have any trouble sleeping after the day we've had. But just to be sure, I'm going to pick up some insurance. This mm -mm, is lavender and it's grown right here in the North State. Well, I'd better stop while I'm ahead and there's still room in my basket. But you can come here to the Chico Farmer's Market every Saturday from 7.30 to 1 p.m. right here at the Municipal Parking Lot. I hope you've enjoyed our trip to Chico as much as I have, but for now, I'm off on another adventure. Now, just about an hour up the road and we're at one of Reading's most popular attractions, the Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And joining me today is Toby Osborne. Thanks for inviting us here today. Thank you for coming out, it's a pleasure having you. 
Thanks. Oh, you know what? I'm really looking forward to going in and checking everything out. But before we do, I want to know, take note of these uh, sculptures that you hear, have here of the turtles. Now, is this why they call it the Turtle Bay Park? Yeah, for many years, this area has been called the Turtle Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Turtle Bay bird sanctuary as well. But back in the early 1900s, the area was fully inhabited with western pond turtles. In all of the ponds, the river didn't flow quite as fast when the dam wasn't there, so there's a lot of standing water, and you'd see western pond turtles all throughout the area. Okay, so they're still in the area today then? They are still in the area. If you go out on the river trail system, you'll see hundreds of them laying out there on logs. Wow. Uh, it's it's really a that. cool sight. That's great, yeah. Well, then I'm even looking forward to it more, so let's go on in. Let's take a look. Okay. Wow, so this is the lobby. This is the Turtle Bay Visitor Center. This is where the okay. majority of our park visitors come in um, to check into the park or to get Reading visitor information. Right. Um, really wonderful opportunity for our guests is $80 for a full family membership for an entire year. Wow, We have great, great programming, yeah. great events all throughout the year, and for $80, people can experience this park all year long. Wow, well, I'm ready for my experiences, so let's go. Let's head on yeah. out. are at the chocolate exhibit with Julia Cronin, the curator for collections and exhibits here at Turtle Bay. Thanks so much for having us here. Thanks for coming to see us today. Well, it wasn't that difficult. You've got all this chocolate. It's so lure. <laughs> well, so tell us a little bit about your exhibit. Well, this is a traveling exhibition mm -hmm. from the Field Museum in Chicago. Right. And it came in six semis because it wow. takes a lot of trucks to haul chocolate. Yeah, I Bolted guess. it all together. We've had a wonderful attendance since the beginning of May. Oh, okay. Now, I noticed that um, you have sort of a, a procession of uh, history to the, the, how we see chocolate today. Absolutely, it takes you full circle from the rainforest where chocolate originates mm -hmm. back to the rainforests where it's harvested today. Right, and you know, I haven't made that connection between the rainforest and chocolate really until I saw it here too. Most so not... people don't. No. Yeah, and they no. don't know that it's actually a way of sustaining the rainforest today. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really great. Now, the history of it, now there's the Mayan and the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. You were telling me a little bit about that. Perhaps you could... Right. Um, the earliest reported use of chocolate is by the Mayan mm -hmm. and civilization, mm -hmm. and it was a drink of royalty. And it wasn't the sweet treat we know today. It was actually a, a bitter, frothy drink with some spices to it. Right. So then how do we get to the uh, milky, yummy variety that we like? Ah, well, you see, you have to fast forward to the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire. Right. And one of the things they took hold, home with them, they came looking for gold, and they went back with chocolate, which oh. is probably as important as gold. Right. And that's where it met sugar and milk. Okay, so we've got to thank them for our mocha. Absolutely. Okay, well, that sounds great. But you know what? I'm kind of wanting to check this thing out over this side of here. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> Well, if life is like a box of chocolates, then this exhibit is worth its weight in gold. But this isn't the only exhibit that you have here. Tell us about what you look for when you put something like this together. Well, at Turtle Bay, we treat exhibitions like a box of chocolates. We really like a lot of variety. So we make sure that our guests get to see something that's going to interest them. We bring in a lot of shows from the outside, and we in-house curate a lot of things to make sure that we're eating everyone's tastes and everyone's needs. See, now, for everybody's tastes, I heard that with this particular exhibit, you get a free sample of chocolate. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. I'll see you around. Well, we're inside the Wings of Summer butterfly exhibit, and you were telling us a little bit about the number of species and a couple of the park rules here too. So. Yeah, we, cur we currently have about 15 varieties okay. of North American butterflies, so they're all native to North America. Um, this is really a fan favorite in mm -hmm. here. It's, it's back after a one-year absence, so we're oh, very okay. excited. We had a yeah. really great support at our annual auction that enabled us to open this again this year. And it really is a gorgeous, tranquil, quiet, beautiful setting uh, where you see hundreds of butterflies all throughout the summer. Right, and so it is only through the summer because that's their life kind of uh, the, the butterflies animals. only last a couple of weeks so we'll refresh yeah. the butterflies throughout the summer but mm -hmm. uh, we only had enough support this year to open it through July 31st okay and so there's no picking up the butterflies but they can land on you they, they can and they, can. And they will quite they will. often especially um, if you're wearing this color because it's not about me it really is about the color right well look at that do you think that's how they got the orange for their wings yeah. oh wow look at those yep beautiful yes now they're on the tiger lily they are. They're beautiful. And so that's really a great, as we are saying, a really great adaptation of color and uh, camouflage for those. And they're eating the pollen. And so you have the oranges around for sugar, I'm assuming. Yep. 
The same reason? Mm -hmm. And tell me about the plants that you're choosing in here. So that the plants are all chosen by our gardening staff. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll come in here at the beginning of every season and, uh, and clean the area out and replant and mm -hmm. bring, in, bring in plants that are uh, native and some that are native, some that are, are good, tolerant, resistant, and can thrive and survive in our climate. Yeah, we picked a lot of plants that are that are nice and, and uh, they survive in this in this redding heat and right. the climate, and they provide a beautiful natural setting for the butterflies here in the butterfly house. That's and, great. And, and for our visitors, it is a very tranquil, beautiful setting in here. Yeah, it really and it's is. very calming when you walk in. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, let's mm -hmm. have a look at some more. Well, from bugs to buzzards, we're going to take a walk on the wild side. And guess what? I just found out I'm going to be in the show. So I'm going to go and get ready. All right, see you. We have a special guest in our theater today. We have Christine McShane from KIXE's show within your reach. Coming up, she's going to help us bring in our first bird today. So this bird travel for miles and miles with very little effort. His flights are a wonder to watch as he uses his long broad wings to soar for hours on end in a truly breathtaking display of beauty and grace. And here he is, Ned, our black vulture. Give him a hand, folks. How about you today, Christine? Pretty amazing. He is eating treats in New Hampshire today. He has about a five-foot wingspan, giving you some nice fanning today. Yeah, All I right, need it. All right, Ned, you want to head right back down there to the stage. He goes, beautiful flight. And thank you, Christine. A big hand for right, Thank you. <laughs> and this is Araya, our red-tailed hawk. Now, red-tailed hawks are easy to identify. Just look for that beautiful rusty red tail. So please welcome out Nashi, our raccoon. Nashi is with us because she was found injured as a kid. Her tail was so damaged it needed to be removed in order to save her life. In the wild, raccoons are found living near swamps. On behalf of everyone here at Turtle Bay, have a happy, healthy, very safe holiday weekend. Bye-bye. Well, thank you. That was an absolutely fabulous show. I had no idea that the animals could be so well-timed and do exactly what they're told. I'd like my dog to come up here and uh, learn a few things from you. <laughs> thank well, thank you. We're so happy to have you and everyone else. You know, we've been doing our show now for about five years. Wow. And we really um, like the animals going out and doing their natural behaviors and mm -hmm. really teaching people about what they're capable mm -hmm. of. And we try to make it a very entertaining. You were. But extremely educational. Yeah. Like, you know, let people be entertained and not realize that we're sneaking all that education in. Right. So they can learn to appreciate these wonderful animals. Right. Now, this here is Loki. This is Loki. He's about three months old now. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be one of the stars in our show. He's learning to live with our gray fox, and we'll be right. able to show the comparison between the two species. So he was orphaned, mm -hmm. and so now he's uh, being raised with us, and he'll be a great ambassador for his species. Oh, wonderful. So if you do come down here, you want to be sure to catch the show. And are there two a day? We have two a day, every day but Mondays, and we okay. go through Labor Day. Oh, good. Okay. Every summer we have the show. Wonderful. You want to check this one out. For the history buff in the family, there's a great museum full of interesting things to see. Just outside the doors to Turtle Bay lies one of Reading's most notable landmarks, the Sundial Bridge. It's an attraction that draws visitors from around the world. The Sundial Bridge was conceived by world-renowned architect and engineer Santiago Calatrava. He's the same man who recently designed the new transportation centre at the World Trade Centre in New York. Now the bridge opened in 2004 and it allows pedestrian access over the Sacramento River for those wishing to visit the entire Turtle Bay Exploration Park. 
It's also the gateway to the 35-mile Sacramento River Trail. The massive structure cost $23 million to build and was funded mainly by the McConnell Foundation here in Reading. The support tower of the bridge rises more than 200 feet into the sky and does actually function as part of a working sundial. Now its shadow is cast upon a large dial to the north of the bridge, but it's only accurate on one day of the year, the summer solstice. Well, this may look familiar to you. It's where we started our day. But soon, there'll be a hotel and a restaurant going in here, right where I'm standing. Now, if you want to keep up with all the changes here at Turtle Bay, including their seasonal visiting hours, you can check out their website. But as for me, I'm going to hit the road and head on up to Mount Shasta. Well, we have talked a lot about the history of the North State, but it's going to be really hard to find anywhere that's as old as where we're going today. We're going to hop on that catamaran and head across Lake Shasta, because that's the only way to get to the Lake Shasta cabins. I'm excited about this trip, so if you're ready, let's go. Well, we've just climbed 850 feet by bus to the tour entrance, and I'm joined here today by Matt, who's going to be our tour guide. Yes. Thanks thank for you. joining us. Well, thank you for attending. <laughs> okay. Now, is this the actual cave opening here that we're at? It's not the natural entrance. The natural entrance is about 250 feet up and just around the corner here on the uh, slope of the mountain. But what we're going through is a man-made entrance that was blasted back in the uh, 1950s. So we're going to go ahead and head up there in just a couple minutes. Okay. Well, I'm actually ready. Let's go for the tour. Let's do it. Okay. So now you were saying that this cave is actually 250 million years old. How do you know it's actually that old? Well, we know that because of the Jurassic fossils that mm -hmm. we'll find on the limestone around the general area as well as inside the caverns. But also, as you'll see in our large room, the cathedral room, we have formations that are 60 to 80 feet long. Well, rule mm -hmm. of thumb is calcite takes about 100 years to grow one cubic inch. Wow, so that's you, slow. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. So you can imagine 60, 80 feet, it's quite a bit. Long time. Okay, so, well, I'm looking around and I see that this uh, signature here, now that can't possibly be 250 million years old. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yes, Jay Richardson's the first person to, our first documented person to explore Lake Shasta Caverns. Mm -hmm. At that time was known as Chalk Caverns. Uh, explored it in 1970, or excuse me, 1878. Yeah. The CM stands for Charles Morton. Charles Morton was the Wintu Indian guide that first found the entrance to the cave. Didn't have the proper equipment to go inside the cave. That's where he rounded up Jay Richardson and they came in. So what's the story about finding the cave in the first place? Well, Charles Morton uh, worked with Jay Richardson down at the Baird okay. Fish Hatchery. It was the uh -huh. first United States federal fish hatchery. Uh, they were working down there. Charles Morton was an avid hunter, was hunting after bobcats, had injured a bobcat. Bobcat, seeking refuge, went inside the cave. All right. Wait a minute, did they um, ever find the bobcat? No, they didn't. So it could be in here. <laughs> Oh my gosh, so here we are in this absolutely gorgeous room, the cathedral room, which is aptly named because these look like the pipes of a cathedral organ. That's exactly why we named it the cathedral room. Okay, so then explain the broccoli trees behind me. Well, you, these are definitely not broccoli trees. If okay. you bit into them, you <laughs> break your tooth. Yeah. But these are formed uh, basically like your shower doors, how they get that calcium buildup. Right. Same way, except on a much grander scale. Mm -hmm. What you'll have is water droplets. This is all formed by calcite water. And uh, the water will come down, go on the outside of these edges, and precipitate little bits of calcite. A little right. bit after a little bit, and of course you get what we have here right now with some of these draperies being 80 feet long. Wow. Now the, all the little bumpy, bumpy places, uh, what is that? That's called cave coral or okay. cave popcorn. Mm -hmm. uh, cavers must be hungry because oh, know, we broccoli. have cave popcorn, <laughs> broccoli, uh, yeah. bacon. But these are subaqueous in nature, which mm -hmm. means they're formed underwater. Okay. Uh, so at one point, this whole entire hillside, as well as this room that we're sitting in, was underwater. Wow. Well, I can see why it's worth coming to. 
But now, why would it be worth coming all the way to Shasta to see this particular cave? Well, we're the only cave in the United States that has a boat ride and a bus ride associated with mm -hmm. it. Now, the caves themselves are, well, like you said, spectacular. But the National Park Service has just declared us as a national natural landmark. So it's not just us saying that we have a beautiful piece of uh, uh, speleothem and cave here, but right. it's the National Park Service. And then you throw in a boot with the, uh, cave, or the boat as well as the bus ride up and some beautiful scenes of Shasta Lake. Oh, what a wonderful what day to spend the day. Mm -hmm. That's great. And congratulations. Well, thank well you. Well deserved. It is just gorgeous and very peaceful. Yes, very mm. peaceful. Well, we had a great time at the caverns this morning, but there was a little time left in the day. So I took the short drive up here to Mount Shasta, where under her shadow lies my favorite store, the Crystal Room, with Beverly's famous singing bowls. Let's have a look. We're used to thinking of our body as something we have to keep healthy, and it carries our head. And our head tells our body what to do, and our body dutifully goes around doing what our head tells it to do. And the head is sure it's top dog. And that's doing. Doing occupies about 10% of our brain. And a lot of times in our busy lives, we find ourselves doing a lot. And we long to stop the world so we can experience ourselves being. And these are interpersonal relationships, our relationships with each other. Which always brings us back to our relationship with ourselves. It's full, it's rich, and we have those longings. Yes, that's me. That's who I am. That's what I want to experience all the time, and we soak it up. And then we get pulled back into doing because there's so much to do. And we wait in longing till the next time we get to experience the expansiveness that we know we really are. It's hard to tear ourselves away from the majestic beauty of Mount Shasta and the magnificent ringing of the crystal bowls. But we've got a job to do, creating a different sort of sound back in my art studio. Well, we've had a great time on our day trips. And so here we are back at the studio and I want to show you how to make a wonderful memento of your trip using just about anything you have around the house. And what I've chosen to do, because we had four cities to choose from and I wanted to put all of them in the piece itself. So what I've made is this whimsical wind chime. So every time the wind blows, I'll remember all those great things we did on our trip. So right down here, I have the wrenches. And I got some of these actually from Bud Bolt's um, Antique Tool Museum. And so they're going to be the music. And then right underneath is a pulley. And that reminds me of boating and so forth. So that's going to remind me of the Lake Oroville boat trip that we took. I got that at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. So again, all of these are recycled pieces. And if you come on up, I have these gear pieces here from bikes. Now, Chico is known for, for being a bike city, and we did a little biking in the park, and then on down to the farmer's market. So I'm going to use that as the base for my wind chime. And right on up in here, I made a little butterfly cage, although it wouldn't hold much of a butterfly. But anyway, that's my Reading Butterfly House there from the Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And then on to Shasta. And both the cavern and the uh, crystal ballroom had crystals of one kind of another. So I went to the craft store on this one and got some pieces of crystal. And these ones have the holes through them already. So it really made it easy to put them on my wind chime. So let's have a look and see how we do that. So let's see how this is done. The first thing you want to do is create your base. So on this one, I'm going to just use two of the gear pieces, and I'm actually going to show you how to do this with the dual recording rather than the wire as another option. So what I've done here is I have tied um, these cords. It's about a foot long, and have just tied the cord to one 
and then the second one and created a space between as you can see. So let's just tie the last one on. I'm going to go through the hole and then just hold it at about where it's going to sit level with everything else and then just tie a little knot. I guess if I was a sailor I'd bring that Orville boat in again and tie it in a boating knot but there we go. So we're just going to hold that up and that, so as you can see that's going to create our center, central piece for everything else to hang from and that's with just the bike gears. Okay so we'll just tie this off at the top just so that everything's nice and tidy and out of the way and that's going to be, that's also going to allow us to hang it as we put the rest of it on as well. So there we go. Now we're going to hang the pendulum from the middle because we have to decide on the height of where everything else is going to hang from. And we'll just start working on it from here. So I'm going to use this time an old piece of jewelry which you can either get these from craft stores <clears throat> you may have it yourself. Now this piece reminded me of the earth around Lake Oroville but it also reminds me of Mount Shasta with the uh, rock formations that we saw inside the cavern. And this is just going to come up through the middle now this will determine, however long you hang that, is going to determine where you place all of your tools as well because we want it to hit. So now my piece is all anchored together right there. So let's hang that all up and we'll start applying. We want to put our, um, we want to put our butterfly in there now too uh, while we have that nice and clear for it to go to. So what I'm going to use to do that is I found these pieces, these butterflies at uh, a craft store and because they are, they're not on the back that I can actually glue these to the cording with my hot glue gun and I'll have my little butterfly sitting in its cage again. So we're going to use the hot glue gun and I'm just going to um, put it across here. Now this craft can be done by kids. This part might be something you'll need to help them with because no matter if it's a low temp gun, st it's still hot, you know. So I'm going to place that on the cording and then place my butterfly, ooh, that's good, together. And that only takes a few moments to set up. So I love hot glue guns for that very reason. So now all we have to do at this point is hang our wonderful tools from it. I chose the wrenches, you don't have to, but it, to me it was fairly obvious because it has a hole already set for you and they're just kind of an attractive thing for tools. And uh, I can't think of any other tool I could put on there that would actually work as well. So now we're really lucky with this because it has all of these grooves on the edges of these gears. So you can kind of guesstimate just how many, and I'm putting five um, of the tools on the all the way around and again we want them to be hung at that same height at some point so it'll hit and make the noise that we're looking for. It's really not that hard to do it's just and that will give us that there up through the bottom. The great part about these gears as you can see is that they have those holes in them I love that it's all almost pre-made for you. There you go last one done and I'll just snip that there because you can, there we are. So now they're all hanging at a, a point where they can all hit our pendulum at the bottom. And the last part of it, of course, is to add the crystals from Shasta. So what I have here are, uh, these, these all come in a packet, there's about 18 of them and I got them at the craft store and they have the hole already through them. So then I took a very lightweight gauge wire and I just cut it into like what about a two and a half, maybe three inch piece. And then you'll slip that through. Do, 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 really easy because you can probably, there we go. And then just pull it up like that and then those can be sl um, slipped through the gear and that's exactly what we're going to do. So now what I have here, if you don't want to go out and buy the crystals, you may have something like this lampshade that I had um, in your home. It already has a sort of a crystal uh, embellishment on it and you can just take those off and use them as well. So don't forget to look around your house you might have things that you can already use instead of going out to buy them. So what we'll do with this now is we're just going to take it through here and figure out how sort of to do it as uh, evenly as possible but just bend those over and you can come back and clip those and tidy it up later but it's really that simple it just has to be 
hung around like that. And then we can just clip those as I said. So I'm going to get the rest of those on and then our piece is complete. Of course you won't want to do this on a windy day. It'd be a bit hard to do. Let's get that. There we go. So as you can see it's going to start to come now. We'll just go in between all of those and start to fill it in. The really great part about making wind chimes and mobiles like this is that the theme is entirely up to you. In this case, we're actually incorporating all four cities, but you could just make it all out of one. Or another trip that you've taken, that would be a fabulous way to remember all the great places that you've visited too, even when you're at home. So we have our bling, we have our butterfly, and we have our noisemakers right down here at the bottom. Now there's a couple more spaces that you can fill in, but these are all fairly evenly placed. Now what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll clip those pieces, but because that wire just bends around so well, those are going to stay up throughout the wind and all the chiming. Well, there you go. Now if you would like to learn how to make this craft or any other craft, just check out my blog on kixe.org. And I hope you'll join us next time as we travel through the North State finding great places that are all within your reach.